Hello everyone, welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. This is episode number three and part one of two of this wonderful guest, Tyler Horty, who is a partner at Cohen Hiley Law Firm here in town. What I love about Tyler is he is amazing at explaining things. So whether you are a first time home buyer, an investor, or you're buying your fifth home, he is really good at explaining everything about Uh, what you need to know as a client. In this first episode, we talk about collateral charge versus conventional, a very popular topic. We talk about how my head turns red when I get angry, and we also talk about what the heck articling means for a lawyer, because I had no idea. So without further ado, here's Tyler. Welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. Finance, life, business, and everything in between. And now, your host, Stephen Green. Welcome, everybody, to our podcast. And today, we've got Tyler Horty, who is a partner at Cohen Hiley. And welcome, Tyler. Thanks a lot, Steve. Hey, thanks for coming in. Uh, so my first question I asked all my guests, I got to figure some of this out because it gets, uh, there's a big maze. How did we actually meet? That is a really good question. So whenever I first moved to town, I originally started practice in London right. and uh, I was looking at coming into the Kitchener market and the firm uh, supported me in that. Uh, I was introduced to you through another RBC at the time, she's now a mortgage agent, but at the time she was a um, private banker or a personal representative on the investment side. We can disclose names here. Okay. We're talking about Kate, right? That's right. All right, yeah. good. So if Kate's listening, thank you, Kate. So Kate uh, was doing some work for friends of my in-laws and I got a chance to meet uh, her through that and uh, she introduced us. Very good, that's right. I remember that because we did a seminar together mm-hmm. and I remember we had a real estate agent, we had you there, me, Kate was still doing accounts, Mm -hmm. and one couple showed up. That's right. I remember that, and I remember, I think I turned red a couple of times, because it was, I was so, I was new at mortgages, and I was so frustrated in the whole bit, and... Yeah, but it, I mean, and that happens, people do their best, and to, you know, people want to give good information, and seminars are a great way to do that, but people need to want to be educated, and they need to take the time to come out. And uh, if your life is as busy as mine and most people's, it's hard to carve out that time to, to make those special one-off uh, trips in for stuff like that. But you know what? It was still fun doing for one couple, and they got the star treatment, and it was like a free private workshop. So yeah, it's funny how it all. Yeah, it's funny how things have changed. I think you know people don't come into workshops anymore; they listen to podcasts, and that's my 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 little marketing thing there but uh you know people listen to podcasts they check the internet out they don't come in anymore for stuff right just different listen to it whenever they can as long as they can yeah in pieces and it uh, works out well and you can reach a larger audience and yeah yeah it's a different way of doing it so so how tell me about your your path in business like where, where did you wake up one morning and say man i want to be a lawyer no uh no so i uh ended up going to university at Western and Western is one of the few universities that offers a combined business and law program so I was at the Richard Ivey School of Business taking my HBA and I decided that if I was ever going to explore law that the time to do it would be uh, while I was there in the combined program and so I wrote the LSAT and based on the results that's when I decided to apply to law school and see how it went and the idea was either to do something in business with the law background or do something in law with the business background and kind of keep my options open. And so that's where the idea came from. Um, But that always kind of colors my decision making or my advice to clients is, okay, from a legal perspective, you know, you have these two or three options. From a business perspective, you really only have one. Like if we really take out the emotion and, and look at the dollars and cents from a business perspective, you know, what should you be doing? So that's how I came to law. After I graduated, I articled at Cohen Hiley uh, in London. And then I uh, was hired back there and practiced as an associate lawyer for several years and became a, uh, a partner with them and opened the Kitchener office six or seven years ago now. Uh, my wife is from Kitchener and so eventually 
she won, and here I am. And uh, funny how that works. Yeah, out, eh? <laughs> sometimes it takes longer than others. I held out for as long as I could. We lived in Woodstock for a bit and split the, the commute, but yep. eventually uh, we moved here, and the uh, the firm was really very supportive in the Kitchener office initiative. So we started with seven people, as I said, six or seven years ago, and we're up to fifteen right now, and wow. still growing. So. You know, and there's been you know uh, growing pains, of course, and challenges and staffing, and we're close enough to Toronto where we lose some good folks at Toronto, and yeah, but uh, it's been a really good experience. So that's where I came from in business. Yeah, it's funny how all things work out like that, and and I'm sure you know you've got that that combination background, law and business, so you can almost take something that you're good at with with a law practice. And then run the place, right? So that must have been scary for you starting that up. It, it was a good challenge. Uh, I I liked it because it was it was a challenge, and I liked it because I could build a team from scratch. Um, what you don't anticipate is for someone that in the profession where the idea, although it might be getting a little bit archaic, is still to charge by the hour. That every hour you spend doing management and human resources and you know hiring and training is one less hour that you spend working on files that you could charge for. But right. it's been a good balance. Some days I wish I had more time to focus on the management side, and some days I wish that the management hat would stay off my head and I could just focus <laughs> on getting some work done. But it's uh, it's been a really great opportunity, and uh, I, yeah. I wouldn't change a thing. I'll, I don't tell my wife this, so I hope she doesn't listen to this podcast. Everybody else listen, but not Heather. <laughs> um, that the move to Kitchener market has been fantastic for business. It's been a really good um, opportunity that way as well. Yeah, you know, and it, it's neat with the Kitchener market. I so I'm originally from Toronto, as you probably know, and I've lived here now. I'm going to say 15 years, and it's it's big, but it's not. You know, I think it, it's it's you got some great people that are here, really you know, like-minded business people, and you can really you can grow a business if you do it right. There are a lot of opportunities. Uh, for sure, and I found that, and it's been uh, a great uh, place to build a practice. For yeah, sure. that's excellent. Good. So I got to ask this question. Um, you know, I'm a mortgage guy. Explain to everybody what exactly is articling, because when I hear of articling, I think of like uh, arts and crafts scrapbooking. Mm -hmm. Explain this to me. Articling is uh, an apprenticeship, really. It's a it's a ten month uh, apprenticeship as someone that's not yet a lawyer but is not a law clerk or legal assistant so it's somebody who is a student at law and has to have completed uh, normally their law degree and uh, depending on the, the year that they were called to the bar um, there's also uh, the bar exams that happen either before or after the articling process but it's a 10-month period for the most part uh, and you have to article at certain firms that need to be big enough to support an articling program and you have to have an articling principal that's willing to mentor the student. Wow. And so what we've had in the last couple of years is too many students coming out of law school and not enough articling positions for them. And so um, the Law Society of Ontario, formerly Law Society of Upper Canada, uh, has come up with an alternative program to kind of um, mirror an articling program without actually having to place students uh, in firms. So, wow. But yeah, so uh, whenever I articled at Cohen Highly, it was a 10-month period right after law school, and I think, I can't even remember now if I wrote the exam before or after, but they're, you know. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, it's so, so it's definitely not scrapbooking. I've, I've got, I've got <clears throat> visions of butterflies and no, fun it, words. It, and, it, and really, it, <laughs> what it is, it's a 10-month it's a 10 month audition to see if you can hack it and if wow. the firm wants to hire you back. And so you're doing whatever it takes. You're, you know, you're working long hours. You don't say no to anything if you can help it. Yep. And you uh, try and put your best foot forward every day for 10 months. So the hope is that you can show them that you have what it takes to be an associate lawyer and come back and uh, build a practice in the area that you want and they have open for you. So, and, and then that's probably, I'm guessing there's probably some lawyers that go through that process and say, okay, maybe I didn't want to do this after all. Do, do people drop out? Uh, yeah. I mean, for me, after articling, I knew exactly that I didn't want to litigate. I, had, didn't, I didn't enjoy the litigation aspect. I didn't enjoy the uncertainty. 
of putting the fate of uh, a case and a client in the judge's hands and not really being able to give a client an idea of what the judge was going to decide. Um, it, uh, the uncertainty and the cost to the client for that uncertainty didn't make me feel comfortable. So by the time I finished articling, although I hadn't had a huge experience in the solicitor's type of work, real estate, wills, estates, corporate, I knew that that's with my business background where I was better off focusing my energies. Yeah, wow. That's it's almost like being with a bank too. Like, do I want to do management? Do I want to do mortgages? Do I want to do investments? I would never do investments. Tried that once, pff, never again. But that's the thing. At least you've tried it, so you know. And in the article, I got to do family law, and I got to do personal injury, and um, they're great areas for people that really like that type of thing. But for me, it helped me focus on where I ended up. Fantastic, fantastic. So, what do you what are you noticing on the on the legal side? I, I always joke. I said, you know, if I'm talking to a lawyer on the phone about one of my deals, something's not right. Something's going sideways. But what do you notice um, trends in in real estate in general going through your law office right now? There aren't a lot of straightforward deals. If yeah. your deal closes without a hitch, uh, you're lucky. Uh, you're seeing a lot more. Um, issues crop up, whether they're title issues, whether they are financing issues, whether it's a, um, a lot of it's timing. A lot of deals are quick closes now. A lot of deals are unconditional again. Oh boy, yeah. Uh, no, no condition on financing, no condition on inspection. And then the bank gets in and doesn't like the number or doesn't like the property and we've got a problem. Um, but it seems like uh, Real estate agents and buyers and sellers are really focused on if they're striking while the market's hot and people are ready to move in two weeks, but that doesn't take into account what all happens behind the scenes. And I think a lot of that yeah. is that people don't understand what it takes to go from a pre-approval on the mortgage side to an approval, to getting instructions to the lawyer, to taking those instructions and preparing documents, to requesting funds, to ordering title insurance, to meeting with the client, to hammering out any issues. And so um, with the smaller amount of time between a deal getting signed and the deal closing, there's less time for, for contingency planning if something goes wrong. That's a, that's a really good word, term for it, yep. And we're also seeing um, a lack of, still not a lack of understanding, but um, bridging, bridge financing and how that works, finding people want to bridge if they can and it makes a lot of sense to bridge um, but there are also challenges with bridge financing the funds often come from a different department from the lender and they often come later and sometimes uh, they don't come at all uh, and it can be a, a challenge that way and then uh, now a lot of bridge lenders if the bridge loan is large enough are securing that bridge loan with a mortgage themselves blanketed over the two properties and wow, so that leads to additional to happen, charges yeah. and additional charges to register it, additional charges to discharge it, and it ends up costing you know the client whenever they call for a quote. Um, we give them a pretty good ballpark, and then when we start getting into that, the that quote disappears fairly quickly in the rearview mirror, and, and sometimes clients can get a little upset. And what I try and tell them is, we're not doing anything extra to pad our coffers. We don't need the extra seventy-five dollar registration in and out, and I'd rather not spend the time having to prep it and discharge it but if this is what we have to do to get the money from the bank or credit union or private lender or whoever then we're at their mercy correct and sometimes we don't get uh, instructions until a day or two before closing especially on the bridge yeah the bridge is a tricky one it, it's you know I, even when i go through it with clients I'll, I'll go through the numbers they generally know what to expect but it's truly i tell them it's not an exact science in, you know? And that that's a good point. Not only is bridge complicated, but every bridge I've done this summer has been underfunded by about three thousand dollars. Wow! Been short. And so we get the bridge three or four days before closing. We calculate our numbers and realize that we're short funds. Normally, what I'll do is if it's within my fee, which is the only thing that doesn't need to get paid on closing uh, that I can <laughs> wait for, I will cover the shortfall and then just bill the client after we close when we redo the report. Oh, fair enough. Okay. So uh, about a thousand bucks buffer. I don't mind. I know where to find them, where they live. It's okay. That's right. Um, and I like to try and help people and save a frantic run to the bank last minute. But at three or four thousand dollars, which is what we s see normally, is that whoever's doing the, the ballpark financing, it, it, it's just not coming off. By the time you deduct 
CMHC insurance and the PST on that amount, which is often which missed. always gets forgotten. Always gets forgotten. Yeah. And then oftentimes there's closing adjustments for property taxes, and some sellers pay property taxes twice a year, not four times a year in town. That's right, especially when you're dealing with a senior, right? Who Correct. wants to pay it in or, advance. Or me, because I forget the second installment because it doesn't come in the mail again. There you go. Uh, <laughs> and then you start looking if there's condos, there's condo fees. And then there's, uh, you know, the from the advance from the mortgage company, depending on the lender, there might be a, a facilitation fee or a prepayment of property taxes. And so we work with the numbers and we're always short. And I say, like, you're better to bridge high and I'll put some extra money in your bank when you buy than to be short and have to scramble last minute. So I'm, I'm, I'm I was a little frustrated sometimes with the, with the bridge just because often it comes from a different department. The documents come later. Uh, sometimes they're not accurate and, uh, and then they're short. And so that causes a lot of stress and the clients take it out on the guy that's the messenger. Which it, and I, you know, as I said, I do my best to try and make the process as easy as possible. But sometimes, if there's not enough cash, there's not enough cash. Yeah. And so we're we're racing. And some people have a little extra they can access, and some people they are already very tight to it. And coming up with an extra three thousand bucks on request is difficult. And that's and that's where you know we talk about the mortgage rules being tighter. And I, I mean, y- you try to get first time home buyers into their home, mm-hmm. you know, and they don't have that money. Right, they've got just enough for closing costs, what they're expecting, of course, right. and uh, that down payment. And you know, not you, they can't always go to the bank of mom and dad. It just can't yeah, happen. That's right. right? Some, you know, it's it's easy to project sometimes your circumstances and the fact that you might have somebody that you can call to help yeah. quickly. But there are people that don't have that, and so you've got to really um, try to. We try and give as much advance notice as possible. Sometimes we're getting statements of adjustment from sellers' lawyers a day or two before closing. You know, I'm, I've been meeting with a lot of clients to sign documents without final numbers these days because, and then having to have them swing by with funds just before closing. And I don't like that because I'm not in the room to explain it, and I'm sending all an email and it's detailed. But for first-time home buyers or people um, that haven't done a lot, it can be confusing. And when people start to ballpark it in their head. And then they see it on paper. Sticker it, shock it, beyond. <laughs> there's, there's, there are differences. And sometimes it's happy differences. A lot of people come in and say, oh, that's about what I thought. And the odd person says, that's a nice surprise. I'm getting more than I expected. And that so, happens more times than not, right? Oh, oh. not so much. Aww. Most of the time, <laughs> it's, wow, I, I was off by like $2,000. Like, wh- where did that come from? I said, well, property tax adjustment, PST on the CMHC. And then we do that number and it's seventeen hundred dollars. I'm like, yeah, okay, there that's where it is. Yeah. And uh, on a sale, it's always the HST on the real estate commission. That yeah, that's a good one too. So whenever whenever I'm trying to tell clients, you know, or they they've got it in their head, but they, they don't want to look at the documents and then that one where we've tried to, to speak about it on the phone and said, No, I don't understand. Like I'm two thousand dollars short. And I said, the there's HST on the real estate commission. And they said, well, no, I mean, you must, you must be mistaken. It must still be in your trust account or maybe you've got it or maybe you've taken it. And I said, no, like there's only so much money. I paid everybody I need to, and this is what was left. And I'm going to assume the lawyer took the money. Oh, well, yeah. How dare, how dare they think that a lawyer might do something nefarious like that? But I mean, that's, that's the hard part because I like to be the bearer of good news. I like to give keys. I like to hand over checks. I don't like to, to hit people last minute with, we're short. Yeah. And sometimes it's the nature of the transaction. Sometimes you're working with another lawyer who's really busy, who's got assistance on vacation, and you're getting stuff very last minute, and sometimes all you can do is react. And yeah, I try really hard for my staff before they call my clients and tell them that there's a problem, that they come to me first, and we can see if we can solve it before it gets to be their problem. And, and that's one thing I like, too. Then, yeah, if we can't then you know, we talk to the client, but the first call shouldn't be to the client. It should be the mortgage broker or the real estate agent, and we try and problem solve it and say, hey, here's what happened, and you know, and here's, here's the result. Sometimes the client doesn't have to know. I closed a deal two weeks ago where the bridge funds were sent to a TD trust account for our firm, which we don't have. <laughs> and so it took three or four hours for them to resend it to the proper trust account which we'd requested it, 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 it's okay it happens and all and all banks 
make mistakes. Um, Just not RBC. So, right. Thanks. Uh, but we closed 15 minutes to 5, and the client came and got keys, and she said, did everything go okay? I said, oh, not really, but we fixed it, and we're closed, and we didn't have to worry about it because we, we got on it, and we didn't say, oh, we don't have bridge funds, and we didn't want you know, the, the broker to get in trouble. It wasn't anybody, so it was a technical error. So yeah. instead of causing a panic, you have, you know, come up with a solution. And that's a big thing. I, I, I've told you that before. You know, if there's any lawyers listening, just call the mortgage guy first because yeah. if it can be solved in a minute and a half as opposed to, you know, going through the client and then coming back to me, it, yeah, I just put worry in the, in the client's mind. And it's not even anyone's fault. Just, hey, where's the stuff? Hey, here it is. And off you go. Yeah, and I, I I know a couple of times with RBC, if we're having issues with funding or things, or I've reached out to you, even if it wasn't your deal, and you've been able to look into it for me and help me out and get the deal closed. And that's all that it's about. You know, every lawyer that's does real estate should be focused on closing the deal and protecting their clients' interests. And love it. Uh, yeah. And that's my big thing is I I want people to be happy and with keys. I don't want them to be delayed in moving. And sometimes. There's not, nothing you can do, but for the most part, you try and minimize that and you try and tell people what they can expect. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, yeah, setting the expectation, right? So explain to me, um, so I've got a couple of questions here for you, and, and it, it's questions I get all the time. And I can explain it, but you know what? Who better to explain it than a lawyer? So explain to me your spin on a collateral charge mortgage versus a conventional well, that's a really good question because I'm often the person who tells the client or borrower about it first <laughs> from some institutions Yes, where yep. it's automatic and you don't get a choice. Uh, I'm the one that says, this is how we're registering the mortgage. And the client looks at me and says, no one told me this. It's, that's more than I'm borrowing and that interest rate's way higher than anybody should ever expect to pay. And so I have to do a lot of the education piece. Yeah. But... There are pros and cons to collateral mortgages. A collateral mortgage lets you register a principal amount in excess of your actual loan amount, in excess potentially of the actual fair market value of the property. So buying for 500000 you can register up to, I know for RBC anyway, you can register up to the purchase price of 500 Okay, so let's yep. do that. You don't borrow five hundred, but you've got five uh, 500000 registered on title. And the rate would be prime plus 7% at RBC, likely, but that's not the actual rate of your loan facility. A collateral mortgage is additional security for the credit facilities you have with that institution, up to the registered amount, up to the registered rate. Your actual amount to be borrowed, your interest rate, your payment frequency, all of that is dealt with through a loan agreement. And that loan agreement is secured by the mortgage. So if you borrow, four hundred thousand dollars which is your eighty percent on your five hundred thousand dollar purchase price right you avoid the CMHC you're gonna only have to repay four hundred not the five and you only pay the interest that you've agreed to with the bank whatever rate that you've been able to secure for them Stephen not the prime plus seven but five years later if the price or the value of the home according to an appraisal by RBC goes up by another hundred thousand dollars there is room for RBC to advance additional funds through an additional credit facility so long as the aggregate amount of the mortgage and the new credit facility don't exceed the registered amount and neither credit facility's rate exceeds the registered rate. And so it's a cheap and great way to extract value from your property without having to see a lawyer refinance the property or register a second mortgage. I have a lot of investors that they're always take the max, take the max because investors want to refi and pull equity. And they're like, can you take more? No, I can't take more. House is only worth 500 right now That's right. <laughs> or whatever it is. Right? That's right. But I mean, and um, I've done it with you. You've helped me with that uh, on, a, on a property as well. So it was a rental property and we bought it. Value went up. The appraisal was done since we registered the mortgage for the purchase price when we bought. We were able to pull out some equity at the cost of an appraisal. Yep. essentially and go shopping for another property and as opposed to having to incur the cost of a refinance new registration discharge yeah. um, title insurance legal fees the whole show 
So what is that prime plus seven? Because I'll get a I'll get a, a client a call from a client or I I had a lawyer call me mm -hmm. and say explain this prime plus seven. What is prime plus seven on a collateral charge mortgage? So that's the enforcement rate. That would be the rate that if you defaulted on the loans and the loan was demanded for repayment in full from the date of repayment forward, then that would be uh, the rate that you would have to pay on enforcement, which is a bit of a hammer to encourage not, not defaulting if losing your house wasn't enough of a penalty. Yeah. Uh, but besides that, it's also the, um, the top end of the rate that's secured. So for example, if you had Prime Plus 7 and you wanted to get an RBC credit card and secure that with your mortgage, the rate that you would be able to get and secure would only be prime plus seven as opposed to, you know, a secure credit card. I don't know what you get 12% is instead of 23, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it might be that they could secure it, but not for the full rate. So oh, okay. like TD does prime plus 10, Scotia does prime plus uh, six sometimes, 10 sometimes. Yeah. It really depends. The thing with the thing, the downside with a collateral is that your equity is hostage with your institution, essentially. Yep. If you want to borrow additional funds and use that property as security, you have to essentially get a second mortgage. You have to go back to the guy that has the first. Right. And you're essentially getting a second mortgage as a second credit facility secured by the one mortgage on title. Um, so that can be a challenge. And if you end up in financial difficulty and your credit drops and you don't qualify for additional credit facilities and you need the money, all of a sudden you can't go and get a second from a private lender. They won't go behind a first $500,000 registration on a $500,000 fair market value home. Because yeah, the bank owns the whole house. The bank essentially, yeah, uh, it's too, there's no equity in it for the second to secure. And if you can't go back to the first and get a loan facility, you have to go and find a new first and that may not be possible either. Yeah. So it can be tricky, and I've got private lenders that won't go behind collateral mortgages because they can't control what the first lender advances and secures against it after the advance of second mortgage monies. Yeah, there, there's so many tricky things, and, and you know, I'll be honest. When I first started, I, I I never explained that to people because I I didn't know it was so important. And then of course, you know, the the bank that's colored green got into a little bit of hot water over it. And uh, now I, you got to take the time to explain it. And a lot of people, you know, they're purchasing an owner occupied. They're taking a home line plan. Um, they're like, ah, oh, no, we. They're just not the type that would need any secondary financing ever because that's their their finance type, right? Um, so they'll just go with the mortgage amount. So just giving them the choice. You know, do I go over that rate part, the prime plus seven? You know, you almost need like a checklist of these are all the possible things. <laughs> right. Well, and I think the thing too that people need to understand is that if. Uh, if you're going to be creative, if you're going to port and like blend and extend, or if you're going to want different uh, components of, of different loan components for your mortgage, uh, for example, what you and I have worked on is a line of credit for 65% and a variable rate for 15%. That, that's You can't secure both of those with one mortgage. So you do a collateral to secure both of them. And so you don't really have an option uh, in that case. but. It's just an education piece. Absolutely. Borrowers sometimes don't get it until two days before closing when they sit down with me and I say, so we're registering it for the purchase price. And they go, but that's not what I'm borrowing. I said, I know. <laughs> and I said, we register it for prime plus 10. They said, well, but that's not what I agreed to pay. That's ridiculous. Well, I know, but that's how we register it. Please hold. Here's the recorded message. <laughs> well, right. And so the, the mortgage is, it's collateral security for a loan facility that's established outside of the registered mortgage. And that's the one in writing with your financial institution. And those are the terms that govern. And the ones that are registered on title are just there to secure repayment of that loan and maybe some future loans up to the registered amount, up to the registered rate. Good explanation, I like yeah. that, I like that. And then of course a conventional mortgage, you're just, uh, the way I explain it, and you're, you're gonna tell me if this is right or wrong, but a conventional is, you know, the bank only owns up to what we're lending to you. So right, conventional mortgage is the principal amount is the actual amount you borrow. The rate that's registered is the rate that you've agreed to pay. The payment frequency sometimes is the payment frequency you agreed to pay. Although a lot of lenders like to have all their mortgages registered monthly, regardless if you pay weekly, bi-weekly, whatever, because it's easier for them to run their spreadsheets and performance and performance, you know, 
analyses. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I'll have a schedule with additional provisions, but a conventional mortgage accurately reflects the loan details. Yeah. Whereas a collateral mortgage won't. A collateral mortgage looks very blank. And the big thing that stands out is in bold letters, it says on demand. And people worry, oh, well, what if they demand it tomorrow? Well, no, they demand it if you default on the terms of the loan agreement. That's, That's important. That's important. Right? right. But people come into me and they say, okay, so when's my first payment due? I don't know. <laughs> well, well, what's what rate did I get again? I don't know. So well, you're my lawyer. Why don't you know? I said, yeah, I'm just in charge of registering the security. I don't have any of the loan details. Yeah, yeah, that does happen with our collaterals. That's mm-hmm. right. And, yes. and for a while, back whenever um, some of the banks were instructing us on collaterals, we even wouldn't know how much we were getting as far as a mortgage advance. We'd have to call and find out. Now, the, okay. Guilty is charged over here at RBC. That's us. <laughs> and, and it's been updated and fixed. But yeah. for a while, we, we'd be registering a mortgage for, for $400,000, not knowing that there was only a $320,000 limit. And so we were doing our calculations based on the face amount because there was nowhere where we were told what our advance was. Oh, and so, I mean, okay. and that's all been ironed out uh, for the most part. But often, now all I know is how much we register it for, how much I actually get in cash money in my trust account to spend on the, the home, and uh, that's it. And all the other details are often dealt with uh, through the branch. Now, okay. if we're dealing with a secondary lender um, where it's not a bricks and mortar bank, but like MCAP or First National or Merrick's or those guys, then we'll have the commitment and all the other documents to sign. So we'll have that detail. Oh, right, yeah. And we'll because, be able to review it. Line. Yeah, that's okay. right. That makes sense. That's right, because we, we sign those up with the, the borrowers and we submit them. Uh, but for the most part from RBC and the other big banks, we don't often have the loan details unless they're through the broker channel. Just a nice little surprise, you know. Hey, hey, well, look at that. There's some money. Hey, well, and and it's and again, all we're doing is securing repayment, and so I really don't need the information. But people are surprised. Clients are surprised. You don't know what my interest rate is. No, you don't know what my payment amount is. No, that would have been uh, what you would go over with with your broker. And, yeah. And they're not necessarily surprised that they know what it is because the broker's done a good job explaining it. But they're just surprised that that information isn't necessary for what I have to do, which is just secure repayment of that loan with this very blank collateral charge. I remember when I got the first phone call of, uh, why doesn't the lawyer have all the details? And mm-hmm. like, he doesn't have all the, what? Really? Mm-hmm. That happens? Mm-hmm. And then I had now, it's like, okay, now take this. You're going to sign this paper. Now take this with you to the lawyer. Right. Because they're not going to know what's yeah. going on other than that, right? Yeah. Yes. So um, it's, yeah, but that's, so I've had collateral charges and I've had conventional. They both have pros and cons. And I think it's really, it really is incumbent on the broker to discuss the pros and cons if there's an option and and get instructions in that regard. Um, I've found it very helpful to have collaterals uh, on some of my properties, um, but I've also found it um can be very restrictive in other situations uh, for clients. So it comes down to the right advice, that's right? right? What's the best solution that's right. and stuff like that? So, yeah. And there you have it. Everything about conventional and collateral charge mortgages explained by a lawyer. Make sure you listen in to part two because we'll be talking about title insurance and how to protect yourself from somebody taking all the equity from your home. We'll be talking about what Tyler did on his first vacation with one of his first deals. And we'll be talking about something you never want to find when you move into your brand new home. Don't forget to follow me on both Facebook and Twitter, RBC Stephen Green, same handle for both. And until next time. Thank you for listening to the Green Effect Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Google Play so you catch the next episode. And don't forget to leave a review. Much appreciated.